Hello everyone. Uh, this class is on the overview of the central nervous system. As promised, this is a recording, video recording of it. So we are going to survey the central nervous system and what it has. And you, most of you have taken AMP, but you might encounter a little bit of a different perspective here and that is based on the most recent classifications of the nervous system uh, as described in the authority of uh, neuroscience and, uh, and medicine. So the central nervous system, first we'll speak about the nervous system in general. When you say nervous system, we speak about anything at all that has to do with neurons, with the nerve, with nerves. And what is so special about the nervous system is that it is able to transmit signals from one uh, part of the body to the other. To, you know, and, and the idea of it is to enable effective communication among you know, various body parts and the brain so that the brain and the nervous system can manage the body and get the body to do what the brain would like it to do because there's nothing possible nothing that you can think about that can be possible without the brain and the nervous system so you can simply think about the the body as as the body of the car you can think of the nervous system or the motor as the part of the car that moves it around that makes it do what it does and you can think about all these wires connected to from the motor to the car or the various parts of the car you can think of that as the peripheral nervous system these extensions and connections that enable the engine to communicate with the various parts of the car so the nervous system consists of two parts first the central which is the brain and the spinal cord then everything that branches out of the brain stem and the spinal cord these are nerves we consider that to be the peripheral nervous system peripheral because these branches the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves that branch out of the spinal um, of the brain stem and the spinal cord they reach and control the extremities of the body and the outer limits of the body so a periphery is the surrounding of something like the edges of something the outer limits of something so again the brain is the central component of the nervous system in the spinal cord you can think of it as an extension of the brain as it includes pathways that bring sensory information to the brain and pathways that bring down motor uh, commands from the uh, higher levels of the brain especially the frontal lobe of the brain that which is dedicated to movement and then send it down to various peripheral neurons so that they can move uh, the various structures of the body so here is the the brain stem and you can see on top of it are the thalamic nuclei if you refer to them both you can say thalamic nuclei if it is one you can either say the thalamus or the thalamic nucleus so usually when you say the thalamus it means one of these two and they're literally the size of a bird's egg and there are two of them each one um, you know kind of deals with half of the body but of course they are extensively connected together so we speak about six major parts of the nervous system the central nervous system First, the 
if we go from below and go up, you go from the spinal cord, I'll go back to the image, you go from the spinal cord, the spinal cord is continuous with the brain stem. There's no, no boundary in the brain between the brain stem and the spinal cord to say, well, here, you know, we start this and we end that. The only boundary is the opening of the skull. In the, on the base of the skull, the biggest opening in the skull is called the foramen magnum. Foramen means a hole. Magnum means great from magnificent. So foramen magnum is the like the great opening on the base on the base of the skull. This is where the brain stem exits as it exits through that foramen magnum. Right at that border, what is below? You say that is the the, the spinal cord because it goes into the spine. And what is above? You call this the brain stem. So the spinal cord first. Then you go above the foramen magnum, you find the brain stem, and the brain stem has three parts based on this class classification I'm giving you. You can call it three parts. <coughs> the medulla oblongata, this structure that looks like a carrot, the medulla oblongata, and on top of it is the pons. You can see behind the pons, you find the cerebellum and the pons are basically an extension of the cerebellum. On top of the pons, these big large cables, one right and one left, these are the midbrain. So if you want to classify, look at the brain stem as two parts, you could, you know, so, some we we'll say medulla and pons, and then they look at the brain, the, the midbrain as one part on its own. But because most, most research classifies these three parts as one, then we go by that division. So the brain stem consists of the medulla oblongata, medulla means the chamber, oblongata means long, and the pons, and then this you know, big cables, these are, uh, they make the midbrain. So again, the whole idea of the brain stem is to bring information, motor information down to the extremities and different body parts and to bring up sensory information. So in each side, you are going to have eight, you know, on that midbrain, you have eight big cables Four of them are motor and four of them are sensory. And then they just shoot from the brainstem way down to through the spinal cord. On top of the brainstem, you are going to find the thalamic nuclei and the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is not showing here. The hypothalamus and the thalamus are called together the diencephalon. Encephalon is a Greek word that means brain. Di means two, diencephalon it means the two little brains. So again, go from below, the spinal cord, then the brain stem, and then, as I discussed, the brain stem includes the midbrain, and then you have the cerebellum, and you have the diencephalon, which I, I described, the diencephalon. So here is the medulla oblongata, uh, first the brain stem below, medulla ob oblongata. You can notice on the brain stem, along the sides of the medulla oblongata, you have all these cranial nerve uh, roots, as, they, uh, as, as you can see, they go from above and go down, you count them, you'll find there are 12 nerves from, they are counted from the top and written typically in Latin numerals. So, medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain. And then you have the diencephalon, which is, like I said, the two 
part brain and this is the thalamus and then that little extension these two pieces these purple pieces here come down from the thalamus these are that is known as the hypothalamus or the lower chamber you could see in down below the hypothalamus there is a little channel and a little um, you know chickpea size like the size of a chickpea uh, structure that is the pituitary gland it is not part of the brain it is simply a pouch it's a gland to store the hormones and secretions that are manufactured by the hypothalamus the hypothalamus as i will describe later is the structure that controls your um, involuntary movements your autonomic nervous system functions the involuntary functions of the body for example like secretions of the body like glands like saliva for example tears um, uh, sweat uh, all of that is mediated by you know the the thalamus has control uh, kind of a big big part of mediating these um, these uh, involuntary um, uh, involuntary functions including uh, for example sexual maturation hormones um, um, uh, diuret anti diuretic hormones to to you know to stop urine for example if the blood has low acid has high acidity and you need water so um i want you to look at this image now and you can imagine if you can imagine here behind the the brain so the brain now this is left this is right and what you see is a lateral view the brain stem has two sides left and right the hypo the thalamus has two parts left and right the hypothalamus is the same the midbrain has two parts so there's a line of symmetry you know going all along i'd like you to imagine behind the pons on the right that the cere cerebellum is here now you could see the middle cerebral peduncle is cut. That middle cerebral peduncle is basically an arm. It's a large cable that brings in all the a lot of the information from the cerebellum, and then just it goes and it wraps around the brain stem and it forms that structure that you see that we call the pons. So the pons is basically um, a bridge that connects the cere cerebellum with the rest of the brain and it also has a superior peduncle and an inferior peduncle one peduncle goes up to the rest of the brain higher structures one goes to through the brain stem down through the brain stem and spinal cord so <coughs> so then what it, what comes after the cerebellum um, I mean, and the, the encephalon. We have the cerebrum. Now pay attention to this. Cerebrum is everything that goes, that is not the parts that we discussed. Everything that's not the spinal cord, that is not the brain stem, that is not the cerebellum, that is not the diencephalon. So the cerebrum is all the white matter all the gray matter that wraps this you know that, that wraps the brain and everything in between the cerebral cortex and these basic structures that i discussed you could see the line here in this slide in this line all of this is cerebrum it basically wraps around it has white matter and gray matter and many clusters of neurons buried deep under in, in the in the white matter so these are called all together they make up the cerebrum now the trick is that the very very top layer of the cerebrum is called the cortex or 
the cerebral cortex. Cortex is literally it's a it's a Latin name for tree bark. So you can see that the, the, the tree itself, you know, the trunk has a solid structure and that thin wrapping around that structure is called the cortex. So when you say cortex here, describe it as the cerebral cortex or the cortex of the cerebrum. So do not confuse the cerebral cortex with the cerebrum. Cerebrum includes, uh, it is most of the the greatest uh, amount of brain um, <clears throat> matter is is in the cerebrum. Now, the parts that you see here, the brain stem and the diencephalon, here, the brain stem and the diencephalon, these structures, they make our primitive brain. Primitive means, doesn't mean bad, it means the, the ancient, the first part of our um, brain our nervous system to form is the brain stem so primitive means early in life it's the first part to start um, so look here up you could see now the brain stem and the diencephalon here and everything else above all of these convolutions or this white structure here that is the cerebrum Again, I, before I move out, you know, continue here, I would like to uh, remind you of some of the structures that we already discussed. So I'd like you to, to pay attention to this. We, as we spoke about the um, auditory pathways, we spoke about the olivary nucleus. The olivary nucleus would be, would be here between the pons and the, and the medulla oblongata. Now you go up, you are going to see the inferior colliculus <clears throat> and we said that inferior colliculus is part of the uh, midbrain and it is dedicated to hearing obviously and it gives you information and it takes the information about intensity um, of the sound wave and about frequency of the sound wave and then it kind of sends that information to the superior colliculus in order to merge auditory information with visual information. So now you hear a sound at a particular angle and you are able to pinpoint exactly where it is coming from and immediately <clears throat> you have a reflex that directs your head and your eyes towards the source of the sound immediately as a reflex. So that's a visual reflex because it is a survival matter. And then at the same time, we mentioned that um, the information also is sent to a, to a little structure beneath the thalamus that is called the medial geniculate body. And from there, it gets filtered in the thalamus and amplified and, and refined. And then the information then goes to the auditory cortex. And you know the rest of the story, and it's in the video. So I just wanted to highlight these structures as they are part of the midbrain in this nice and clear image. You could see also here, that is the inferior colliculus, that is the superior colliculus, and you could see now the medial geniculate body that is sitting beneath the thalamus, and it's actually part of, part of the thalamus, considered part of the thalamus. By many, um, by many researchers. So let's look now. We are going to look at the spinal cord briefly, and then we will uh, focus more on the um, the brain itself and the structures. So we said that the spinal cord is an extension of the brain. You think of it simply that the brain has all these neurons. Every neuron has a little extension, a little axon. And all these axons are bundled up, bundled up, and all the connections come together, and they are bundled into that gigantic cable that we know as the, the uh, spinal cord. And that spinal cord is simply, you know, wires, uh, kind of um, half of them 
going down to bring motor movements, motor commands to move the body, and half bring sensory information to enable you to sense your organs, to have pain, to, to feel pain, to feel the movement and orient and all. So half sensory and half motor. And then of course you have different things traveling in the spinal cord like blood vessels and various structures, the immune system and so on. But the spinal cord is a continuation of the brain. It is the tail of the brain. So the spinal cord, let me show you, uh, actually, no. the spinal cord is, as it goes down, exits the, the skull, it is threaded into every vertebra. We studied the vertebrae when we studied the, we studied the respiratory system. So every vertebra has a spinal canal. If you touch the middle of your, the center of your back, you feel this, you know, spiny, you feel your spine. And each vertebra has a spinous process. And right, like a little bit deeper, you know, behind your finger, as you touch the spine, the spinous process of the, um, of the vertebrae, about maybe one third of an inch or one half of an inch, you are going to find the spinal canal. And every vertebra has a spinal canal. All of them are stacked on top of each other. And the spinal cord goes from one to the other into a complete, you know, canal that actually, try, you know, is continuous from one uh, vertebral disc to the uh, vertebra to the next. So, for this reason, the parts of the spinal cord are divided into based on this, the, the name of the vertebral uh, or the vertebrae that it passes through. For example, the seven vertebrae of the neck, that part of the spinal cord is called the cervical, cervical segment of the spinal cord. Now you go down, what do you call the 12 uh, verte vertebrae that are in the back of the thorax? You got it right. It is the thoracic vertebrae. So the thoracic ver vertebrae are so called because they form the back of the, the um, uh, thorax. So the segment of the spinal cord that is threaded into the spinous, the sp Spinal, spinal canals of the cervical, uh, I'm sorry, of the thoracic vertebrae, that segment is called the thoracic segment of the spinal cord. The segment that is below, that goes through the five lumbar vertebrae, that is called lumbar segment of the spinal cord. And then beneath that, you have the sacral segment, and just Again, these are segments, but the spinal cord is the same. It is extending from top to bar bottom, continuously the same structure. We just know the landmarks as, you know, we divide it for simplicity to know, um, you know, what innervates what part of the body. So the functions, again, is there are two functions. Number one, to bring motor commands from above to the rest of the body so you can move it. Number two, to bring sensory information from below the rest of the body so you can feel the rest of your body and get sensation about how it moves, how it adjusts, how it functions, and so on. So now we're going to speak about the brain stem structures. So it consists of the medulla oblongata, as I explained from below, to go on moving up, and then the pons, and then the midbrain. Again, excuse me for the repetition because um, since you don't have my physical presence and where you would ask me to repeat, I'm kind of repeating and rehashing things over and over to hopefully make you understand things clearly. The brainstem as a whole, as one piece, 
the, like the whole thing, the basic functions. Think of it as your primitive kind of, you know, the system that manages the primitive functions of the body. That means that system is the earliest part of the nervous system to develop, and it controls a little body that is not yet able to think or hear or anything. But you need that little body, you know, when it is the size, basically the size of your binky. At that time, the body is, is kind of, it looks like a human being when it is the size of your binky, like, a, like the size of a, 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 um, a peanut shell with three pieces. So, obviously, you can't do much with that little uh, you know, uh, you, you want that little brain, but you can't do like sophisticated functions with it. You want it to move, uh, to make the heart beat. You want it to make, um, to make blood pressure flow and, and, you know, different functions that you do not have control over. So the brain stem works very closely with the hypothalamus to control your autonomic nervous system functions. The, the brain stem also gives rise to the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are called cranial. Pay attention to this because some people make a lot of mistakes with this. The cranial nerves are, are called cranial nerves because they, their origin, their root, is on the brain stem inside of the skull okay inside of the skull and then these nerves exit exit the skull and then they go and control various parts of the face and neck and and, and body and intestines and all of that so the important thing is to say that they are called cranial because they originate the their roots are inside of the skull, and that's all. That's the answer on the brainstem. So you could see structures of the brainstem. You have respiratory systems here to control rhythm of your breathing. Uh, you have respiratory systems here also below in the pons. So, and then you also have cardiovascular systems uh, to control your blood vessel, you know, con um, dilation, uh, raise blood pressure or, or lower blood pressure. And you have the olivary nucleus. We discussed quite a bit um, uh, olivary nucleus structures as they pertain to, to hearing. And you could see on top of the, that green olive, that olivary nucleus they call it the green because it, obviously it's not green but it is it looks like an olive you can see the cranial nerve number eight the vestibulocochlear nerve and as it you know as it, uh, it 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 gets in there and on top that top segment is dedicated to hearing so let's look now at, there's one structure of the brain stem you see, it looks like a worm here and extends from the pons all the way through the medulla oblongata. So that is called the reticular formation. That reticular formation makes it, this is like a worm like, and it is reticulated. It looks like it has dark brown and light brown patches that are like structures, structured like the color of a giraffe. A giraffe is reticulated. And that is because this reticular formation structure makes its own neurotransmitter, uh, uh, neurotransmission systems, and it is the oldest structure of the entire brainstem. It is the oldest structure of the entire nervous system. That is your, your reticular formation. And it regulates, among the functions it, it regulates, regulates the circadian rhythm, 
which means your wake and sleep cycle as it is connected and regulated with the natural light. Um, so in the morning it makes you wake up and at night it makes you feel sleepy. And it works with the frontal part of the brain. You could also see how the cerebellum is. The cerebellum has left, it has right hemisphere and left hemisphere. It has a cortex, it has white matter. The difference between the cortex of the cerebellum, we call it the cere cerebellar cortex, uh, as compared to the cerebral cortex. The cere cerebellal, sorry, cerebellar cortex has three layers and the cerebral cortex has six layers, but both of them are less than a quarter of an inch. You could see how this big area here, it is cut on the side. That is the media, middle or medial cerebellar peduncle, that large cable that brings all the, you know, neurons and extensions from the cerebellum and goes around and wraps to make the pons. And now you could see that the, the, the part that's going up here, that is the superior cerebellar peduncle that goes into the higher structures of the brain. And then the lower one going down, it is called the inferior cerebellar peduncle, and it goes into the brainstem. And you could see the inferior colliculus, the superior colliculus. So you have a, a frontal view here of the brainstem and the diencephalon. You have a lateral view of the brainstem and the diencephalon. So the functions, again, overall of the brainstem is that it receives sensory information from the skin and from the muscles of the head. And that is from the cranial nerves because they innervate our facial structures and our skin and the head, the head and so on. It provides motor control for the head. This is how you can move your neck back and forth. That is because of the cranial nerves that control that. It serves as a relay say, station for sensory information as it comes from the spinal cord and for also motor information as it goes down into the spinal cord. It regulates your levels of arousal. Arousal here means that you are physically awake and up. So as opposed to someone in a coma, for example, or, uh, or a, um, what they call it, um, a state of uh, obtention or something like that. So it regulates your levels of arousal and awareness through the structure that I described as the reticular formation. This, uh, let me go back to one of the images. You see these clusters here, typically the gray matter has the cell bodies of neurons where the neurons make food and make have DNA and they make parts to pre reproduce other neurons and so on. And that is 80% of, the, of the, the cell bodies reside in the cerebral cortex. However, deeper in the brain, you are going to find clusters of cell bodies of neurons that are clustered together and they serve particular functions. These, these are called nuclei. So this is the olivary nucleus. Nucleus is one, nuclei is more. And then this is the cardiovascular, um, cardiovascular nucleus or center. So all of these are called nuclei. And the basal ganglia are also called the basal ganglia nuclei because when you say nuclei, they have clusters of cell bodies. 
but otherwise the rest you know is is white matter so some of the nuclei of the brain stem control motor output to muscles of the face eyes and the neck and again why is that i know some of one some of you got it because of the cranial nerves the cranial nerves the 12 control the head and the innervation of the entire face and nasal cavities and all of this and the neck and even the shoulders and then one cranial nerve called the vagus nerve travels down to control everything inside of the trunk and if you remember the phrenic nerves of the diaphragm they are branches of the cranial uh, of uh, the vagus nerve so some of the nuclei um, are they process information from three spinal uh, three special senses these are hearing and you, you got it the hearing is is the cochlear nucleus the olivary nucleus um, and then balance uh, vestibular obviously nerve and taste so hearing balance and taste are these three senses are controlled by the brainstem let's now take different parts of the brainstem and look at some of their functions briefly because you could write a book on each one of these the medulla oblongata or other structures the medulla oblongata is very important for autonomic functions these include your digestion luckily you don't have a button to press and say okay now digest and you you press and put it on um liquids or um you know hard like uh, crunchy foods or you know you don't do that the stomach just you know it is operated autonomically a breathing uh, breathing is a complex operation you have to spend a specific amount of time expelling air a specific amount of time taking air in it has to kind of be rhythmic but if there's a problem like a car accident the person cannot regulate the the two parts of the cycle will not be complete and breathing might not i mean uh, uh, you might not be able to get 12 breaths per minute as an adult uh, you might even um, on the other side you might be breathing more you know 25 times or more for example so whatever happens in, in accidents or disease can change these patterns but they are regulated like timed and very precisely measured so they are balanced naturally by the medulla oblongata nuclei that the, that um, control breathing heart rate your heart has to beat a particular number of times per minute so it can <clears throat> it can bring pump oxygen into the body and can bring in circulated uh, blood that is depleted into the heart again to to bring in oxygen to it and so on so that heart rate also is going to increase if you are nervous or if you are exerting physical activity so all of these natural um, changes are made possible by the medulla oblongata so it enables you to regulate your functions based on what you are doing based on your activity and on your emotional status the pons we said pons means bridge and it is the bridge that connects the cerebellum with the rest of the you know the brain and the brain stem so primarily it relays takes motor input from the cerebral cortex above and um, in both hemispheres left and right and brings that to the cerebellum so it is a connection between the two cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum but particularly bringing in motor commands now you go above the brain, the midbrain, as these two large, you know, cables continuous with the brainstem. That 
think about that as eight, each size has eight large cables, is made up of eight large cables, four cables for motor and four for sensory information. Four bring, go, are called descending pathways. They use particular neurotransmitters like the acetylcholine and, and dopamine and so on, and four use sensory, uh, I mean, they are sensory or afferent. They bring in sensation from the different parts of the body. So the midbrain enables us to coordinate sensory and motor functions, including eye movement. Eye movement is very complex. It can move left, right, up, down, uh, at an angle like that or like that. So it's a very complex um, movement. And it has four, there are four um, neuro, um, four cranial nerves that have to do with the eyes. For example, the pupil, when you shine a light into it, it's going to constrict naturally, unless someone is uh, under the influence of drugs or alcohol, for example, or sexual arousal. They, you know, when someone is sexual aroused, the pupils dilate, are dilated naturally, you know, to, to give signals to the other, to the other person. So, um, also, the midbrain, is uh, controls coordination of visual and auditory reflexes. Now, what are the structures that I just mentioned a few minutes ago when I mentioned, spoke about the localization of sound in the brainstem? Said so the signal goes to one particular structure, and then from there it goes to two structures at the same time, and one of these structures integrates visual information about intensity of the sound and about about um, uh, uh, frequency or pitch of the sound so it ends up pinpointing the direction of the sound you know where exactly the sound is coming from and then that information is integrated with the visual system so that you hear it, you know where it is coming from, now you need your head to turn in the direction of the sound. If you thought the inferior colliculus and then the superior colliculus, inferior is vision, I'm sorry, hearing and superior is vision, then you got it right. And we said the superior colliculus then, I mean, the inferior colliculus sends the information to the superior colliculus and then it sends it to the uh, medial genital body of the thalamus. And that information then, you know, is integrated and refined. But the superior colliculus enables you to integrate information about the angle and loudness of the wave to know how far it is, and then immediately integrate it with your visual system so that you, and you have the reflex. When you hear a sound immediately without thinking, you look at the source of the sound and then you can either run or do whatever based on what you see uh, making the sound. So now we speak about the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, in the past, in the ancient days of the Greeks and Romans, they thought of it as the little brain. They thought it was a miniature brain on its own, of its own. Then, in modern days, just about 10 years ago, or maybe in the past 10 or 15 years ago, they indeed confirmed that the cerebellum is a little brain on its own. It doesn't mean that it works by itself. It, 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 it has a map of the entire cerebral cortex of the right hemisphere, left hemisphere, and it has, but these are on a smaller scale, and moreover, the similar, the areas of the cerebellum, for example, that, you know, help with language, they are connected with the areas of the brain 
that help with I mean the cere cere cerebral cortex that help language. So for example, but the difference is that the right hemisphere of the cerebellum is connected with the left hemisphere of the cerebral cortex. And the left hemisphere of the cere cerebellum is connected with the right hemisphere of the cerebral cortex. There are circuits that connect the language centers of the cerebral cortex with the language centers of the cerebellar uh, cortex. And so you have these motor areas of the cerebellum are also connected with the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. So it is very important for motor learning, for uh, language, for coordination of movement, for sensory input, and for enabling us to plan motor uh, movements. So when we speak about the motor system for speech, the cerebellum plays a role early and also plays a role later in the coordination. So it modifies the force and the range of movement. For example, think about Tiger Woods. When he plays golf, or one of these masters, in order to be successful, they have to measure visually a distance and they have to hit the golf ball from where they are to that distance. So you, you have, in order to make it reach a certain distance, you have to measure how much force you are going to put into hitting that ball based on how far it is if it is close or if it is, you know, far away. If it is close and you want to hit it to get it into the hole and you hit it hard, then it's going to overshoot. It will not achieve the purpose. If it is far away and you want to hit it and you don't hit strong enough, then it will not, it will undershoot. It will not reach its target. So um, anything that you want to do, you do a lot of calculations and measurements in terms of how much force you are going to put into that movement to achieve your target. So, uh, for example, when you pull an arrow, you know, you are shooting an arrow. How far do you pull the, the string back? Uh, you, are, you are going, if you want it to go far away, you obviously have to pull way, way back. And if you don't want it to be far away, then, you know, you regulate the strength and the amount of force that you are going to put uh, based on the move on the target where it is. And that is very important in sports and in motor learning. And the cerebellum is the right tool or the right structure that enables you to modify the force and the range of movement based on your purpose and the location of the target. It enables you uh, to um, uh, learn anything that requires motor uh, movements that are in sequence, like dancing, like, um, let's say, martial arts, um, playing, any, any of these um, um, uh, sports that you see on TV, they all, all require impeccable cerebellar function. And it also, the cerebellum, contributes to cognitive functions and contributes to speech and language functions. As I mentioned, it has all the input from it, from its cerebral cortex, from the white matter, from the gray and white matter, all is bundled up. So they think about this. The brain has a big cable that, connect, that collects all the, the neurons that are coming out of it. We know that as the spinal cord. The cere cerebellum has three tails, three tails, okay, that, that collect all the input of the, that's in the cerebellum. And these three tails, one goes up to the brain, one goes down to the spinal cord, the middle one goes around the, the brain stem to form the pons. So this way, 
the cerebellum can connect. It connects with higher, lower, and structures that are right across from it. Back to the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Thalamus again means chamber. And I told you medulla also means chamber. And the reason is some of these words come from Greek and some come from Latin. So we still maintain both. So the thalamus is the size of a bird's egg. And there are two of it. One on the, for the right side, one left side. And they are very, very well connected in between. The thalamus is the gateway. And everything above it is in the cerebral cortex, uh, cerebrum, is going to go through it. Everything below from the brain stem and other structures is going to go through it. So it processes most of the information that reaches the cerebral cortex from the rest of the central nervous system. Your arms, your legs, your ears, you, you name it. It gets sensory stimuli. So sensory stimuli, it means you're hearing. For example, you hear a sound. The sound is too loud. The thalamus is going to dampen it. It's going to just, just suppress it to make it just right. The sound is not adequate enough. The thalamus is going to amplify it. You know, it's going to make it um, louder. So it kind of gets sensory stimuli. The hypothalamus, we said, it regulates your autonomic nervous system functions. It works with the brain stem very closely and it controls endocrine functions like sexual um, reproduction, um, you know, for example, menstruation, um, you know, all these functions that are sexual or body maintenance uh, in terms of running the entire, uh, you know, body, um, visceral functions. So autonomic, all of it is autonomic, autonomic. Now the cerebrum has, again, it, it is everything that is not the brain stem or the diencephalon. Everything else is the cerebrum. Uh, wait, wait. Everything that is not the brain stem, the diencephalon, or the cerebellum. Okay? Everything that is not the cerebellum, the, the brain stem, or the diencephalon. So all of that huge structure that wraps around that you see, all of this, that is the cerebrum, cerebrum. You open it, when you look deeper, you are going to see that is part of the cerebrum, 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 all of this, and the brain stem, the, all these structures here, and the diencephalon, they are not cerebrum. The um, cerebellum is not. So all of this structure here now is the cerebrum. And we divide it, of course, into various structures so it is very, very important for you to pay attention to this because I don't want you to confuse the cerebral cortex with the cerebrum. The cerebral cortex is simply the top cover that is less than a quarter of an inch. The top cover wrap, wrap, wrapping around the entire cerebrum. So it's the outside, outside layer that is wrinkled and convoluted. When you go down, you are going to see, uh, you will find the basal ganglia. They are nuclei buried in the white matter. They are not showing here, but they are part of the, um, part of each hemisphere, part of the, the white matter of, buried in the white matter of each hemisphere, basal ganglia. And then you have the hypothalamus, um, I'm sorry, the hippocampus that is dedicated to memory encoding, taking in like new memories, new information that comes in, but it does not store 
memories. It just processes them. And the amygdala or the amygdaloid nucleus or the amygdaloid body. Okay, so it has different names. Amygdaloid nucleus, one. Amygdaloid nuclei, both of them. Amygdala with an A at the end. Amygdala is one. Amygdalae with AE is two. Okay. Um, so I'm just telling you these names because you might encounter them in different books and you wonder, is it the same thing? Yes, it is the same thing. Let's see. Um, so, you, these structures that you see here, the, the, the brown ones, these are all the, um, the uh, basal ganglia. Basal ganglia. So you could see they are inside deep in the white matter of the right and left hemispheres. And you could see now here in a clearer picture, you have the putamen, you have the caudate that is connected to the putamen, and then the tail of the caudate. The caud caudate means tail, so tail of the putamen. And then the tail itself has another, you know, the, the lower part of it is called also a tail, tail of the caudate, like tail of the tail. <laughs> and you go down and connect it to the, connected finally to the caudate, then you have that little piece that is the, um, that is the amygdala or the amygdaloid nucleus, which is your, um, your fear center your emotional processing system. You could see how the thalamus sits next to the, to the basal ganglia behind. So you have the thalamus here and next to it you have a, a, a putamen and then out of the putamen you have, you know, the caudate and the caudate, the tail of the caudate and then you go have the, um, that little tip from it that is uh, your um, amygdala. And Along this area here, you are going to have the hippocampus. So this system that we have here is called sometimes the limbic system, and it regulates three critical functions that are connected. So just to understand how, for example, emotions, motivation, and learning and movement, how these are critically connected, all of them together. And now, this is a coronal cut. When you cut the body into two pieces flat, you know, front and back, and you now see between the two hemispheres here, you see that is the, the um, longitudinal fissure that makes right hemisphere and left hemisphere. And then you have the corpus, uh, the corpus callosum will be beneath here, lower. And then you have one thalamus, one thalamus, and then these structures here, the gray, a uh, blue, and dark blue, and then the sub subthalamic nuclei, uh, substantia nigra. One, two, uh, three, four, actually one, two, three, four, and five. So five structures basically make up the basal ganglia. Of course, they are not like these here as you see are like this. You are seeing them when you slice, instead of this, you slice them like that and you look here. So you see the tips of them, um, like a cross section. So you can see now, the surface of the brain, again, the cerebral cortex, it has four lobes that are visible. So the frontal lobe named after the frontal bone, the parietal lobe named after the parietal bone, the temporal lobe named after the temporal bone, occipital named after the occipital bone. So these are the structures that are visible. You will be mistaken if you think that this is all that the cerebral cortex is about. 
typically many people just go say oh four lobes of the brain no there are more than four lobes of the cerebral cortex i will show you so the cerebellum uh, sorry <laughs> i keep <laughs> mispronouncing the the cerebrum consists of the again the cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia the hippocampus the amygdala amygdala or amygdaloid nucleus now we will take the cerebral cortex only the cerebral cortex has the four lobes that i just mentioned in addition it has a lobe that is buried underneath be below the foldings and that is called the insula or the insular cortex of course from the name you will understand that this is like the insulated part the part that is buried beneath the folds so this is how it goes you have different parts you know coming together being folded and then you end up having a piece that is buried underneath that is when you simply just open up the foldings you can see it continuous with the rest so that is one lobe and it is not usually called lobe it's just called the insular cortex or the insula by the way also you could call the frontal lobe as the frontal cortex the occipital lobe as the occipital cortex any of these so-called lobes you to call them cortex 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 that is also acceptable and then you have the cingulate gyrus so i will show you the insula and i will show you the cingulate gyrus first the cingulate gyrus is if you are looking here the cingulate gyrus is this gyrus um, this is the front of the uh, the front of the brain this is the back the cerebellum it would be fitting here so you could see um, how this motor motor cortex and the premotor area are extending between the two hemispheres and then see how the orientation is the 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 gyri you know come down come down come down all of them coming this way this way this way now this one comes this way so it is unique it is a single gyrus that goes all the way from the back to the front and it is on back of what is that structure on back of the corpus callosum so by the way the corpus callosum is part of the cerebral i'm sorry part of the cerebrum as well the corpus callosum and it is the biggest commissure or bridge that connects the two hemispheres so you can see that blue area here that is the cingulate gyrus and this area is the hippocampus and in front of it you see the amygdala when you open now let me go back see if I, this structure here here you have the parietal lobe here you have the frontal lobe here they, you have the um the temporal lobe right in the corner here that between the the edge between the uh, the um, frontal lobe and parietal and temporal this area here this circle if you simply pull down the temporal lobe and pull the pull up the the um, parietal and pull up the frontal you are going to see this so you could see now that is 
the insula. That is the part of the cerebral cortex that is buried, co covered by the folds. I will give you a very important piece of information that is critical, you need to know it, and you need to take notes. Go back to the, uh, this area. See that little segment here? That corner of the parietal cortex, this little corner here. And of course, the part that is buried inside also. And this little part that is also buried, that, that's also between the, you know, inside of the fissure, lateral fissure. And this little part, these three segments here, the parts of the three different lobes, they are called orpicula, uh, orpicula, uh, operculi, operculum, operculum means lid, like the lid, lid of a pan, the cover of a pan. And these operculi, operculae, so operculum, 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 they cover the insula. And they all are dedicated to language and speech functions. So the frontal operculum, the parietal operculum, and the temporal operculum, what are they? They are the edges of these frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes that cover the insula. And all of them are dedicated to speech, language, and hearing functions. So now we said that the, cerebr the um, cerebral cortex is dedicated to cognitive functions, language functions and speech, sensory functions, motor functions. So these are huge and each one is a huge, huge field. But I'm just telling you, giving you the superficial view and you'll get the rest in the neuroanatomy class. The basal ganglia, we know a lot now about them. Uh, they regulate motor functions. They regulate mood and emotional states. They regulate language and social pragmatic skills. So the basal ganglia are connected very, very um, extensively with the frontal part of the brain, with the prefrontal cortex. And also they are connected with various parts that have to do with movement, with mood, and with um, uh, learning and memory. Then you have the hippocampus. That is your memory, notice, memory processing center. I'm not saying storage. Storage is different. All the information that we learn is stored in the cerebral cortex. For example, when you see an image, it registers in the occipital cortex. Then it is sent to the hippo, uh, hippocampus to be processed, to be sorted out, to be broken down, to be uh, kind of re, you know refined and analyzed and connected with your memory systems. Then it goes back again to be stored back in the visual system. So um, if you ever had the pleasure of going into a mail processing facility, like I once I was traveling and then I had an important piece of mail, my mail was stacked and held in the post office, I mean in the, um, you know, post office processing center. So I had to go <clears throat> from one place to another until I went. Uh, to, uh, to the largest place, I, I don't remember where, uh, like Brockton or something like that. And you have like a large moving belt, very big, and the post um, office workers bring in, you know, the crates, and they dump them on one end and sort throw the stuff on the belt. And the stuff, all these letters come in, they scan, and then they find you know, the belt moves them to one area, um, routes them to one particular area, and all of them are sorted out. You have other people on the other side taking, uh, basically the mail that is going to one town is sorted out in one crate, 
and the mail that goes to another town is sorted out to another crate and so on. Think of the memory system, the hippocampus, just like that. Any kind of information that, that comes your way, any kind at all. Someone smiles, uh, you, have a, you read a sentence, you hear a song, anything at all from all your senses that comes in is going to find its way to the uh, hippocampus. And then the hippocampus will take that information, sort it out, classify it, <coughs> categorize it, tag it based on how important it is, and then sends it to the parts of the cortex where that information will be stored. And the hippocampus also is very important when you want to get information back from the storage, like say, I ask you, uh, you know, a question, a short answer question. You have to go to the hippocampus to access the information. The hippocampus is like a switchboard that is connected to every room in the hotel. So you want to say, oh, uh, I would like to speak to Mr. So-and-so. Okay, just a minute, click in the room, and they you just now are able to know who is in that room uh, and get the information about the person. <coughs> so because the hippocampus is connected to all uh, storage sites of the cerebral cortex, it, it is necessary so that it can pull the information that you want to retrieve and give it. If you want to bypass the hippocampus and know exactly, just know, if the information has landed in, in the storage sites without going through the hippocampal route, you get the true-false questions and you get the multiple-choice questions. So the fact is, these kinds of questions are to test new memories. And the short essay, short answer questions, is to test memories that have been there for a longer time to see if the hippocampus is able to get back this information. So in reality, true, this is why true or false questions and multiple choice questions are called recognition questions. It's kind of, do you know, have you seen it before? Is it there or not? So they are much easier than, than retrieval in that regard because the retrieval is more rigorous. So then the amygdala is your emotional processing center. It is your fear mechanism. Uh, it, it is, for example, very hyperactive, goes crazy if someone has a phobia. It is hyperactive. If some, um, someone is happy, someone, so it is in sync with all your body and it enables you to kind of feel, feel your body, feel how your body is adjusting to new situations and um, and you know that emotions, uh, the purpose of them is to preserve your life, to prolong your life and to protect you. That's why we feel love, we feel, you know, uh, we feel disgust, we feel this, we feel that. All of these are feelings that eventually they evolve for the purpose of protecting your life and making you feel adjusted. So when you feel happy, that really makes you live a, a quality, a good life. And when you are happy more, you live longer. That is a fact. It is not just made up. So these social uh, you know, gatherings and getting to have a nice friend uh, circle of friends and family connections and all of the, that puts you in a good frame of mind and it makes your body um, function better and it, it protects against uh, cardiovascular disease and all of this. So it, it is uh, emotions are very important for learning and for memory and motivation. I speak a lot about this in national and international conferences. And then <clears throat> the amygdala also, it, was, um, uh, it is connected to the endocrine system very, very closely. For example, in endocrine system, it is where the glands of the body, you know, for example, your adrenal cortex that sits on top of your kidneys, the one that, the, that, that makes adrenaline, that rush and, and, you know, strength that you have when you are very excited or very angry or, you know, stuff like that. 
So immediately as you sense fear, you are going to, to shift into the defense mechanism or the fight uh, or flight mechanism. Uh, and that is gonna give you as much power and force as, as, uh, as, as, as possible. And that is triggered, that system is triggered by the amygdala. Uh, first, when I speak about um, lateralization of functions in the brain, it is sad to say that there are some people today and they go and speak and write books and stuff and they still... So you still hear once in a while about someone is a left brain person on someone is a right brain person. That is not right anymore. That is not right. Yes, there are areas in the, in the brain, like the left side of the brain, that are dedicated to language functions. Like Broca's area only exists in the left side of the brain. Wernicke's area only exists, I'm sorry, in the left side. Wernicke's area only exists in the left side. Broca's area only exists on the right side, the right hemisphere of the brain. Um, so there are areas that are dedicated to specific functions, but we need to be very careful. These areas cannot perform their functions without other parts of the brain. The brain works using circuits. So if you have Broca's area, yes, it you know it has syntax it has um it has uh, lexicon vocabulary it it does motor programming for speech however it cannot do its function without being connected to various parts of the frontal left uh, left frontal lobe and right frontal lobe and other parts of the brain just imagine a single word that you say or that you hear makes more than 50% of the brain fire to process a single word. So it isn't anymore left hemisphere person, right hemisphere person. So I'm just simplifying to say, generally, the left hemisphere is more dominant for syntax, grammar, for word semantics, vocabulary, for processing of speech, acts, or um, kinds of, of sentences like do this, do that, ver different kinds of sentences. And, and the detection of lies, for example, you know, if someone says, you know, uh, something and then they don't mean it. So it's a polite way to say the detection of lies in the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere generally looks at the global aspect of, uh, language for example when you speak say sentences words the left hemisphere is dominant when you say the meaning but the left hemisphere could be literal like when you say um it is raining cats and dogs the left hemisphere would give you raining and then cats coming down from the sky dogs coming down from the sky but the frontal part of the brain, left and right hemisphere frontal part, so say, no, no, suppress that interpretation. And that it gives rise to an interpretation from both right and left hemisphere uh, frontal loops to say, ah, that is not a, uh, meant to be a literal meaning. It is supposed to be metaphorical. It means simply raining heavily. So you see that um, when you have a story, the left hemisphere looked at individual words, individual sentences, and the literal meaning, right hemisphere, looks at the entire story as a whole, as one piece, how one paragraph is connected with the next one, and how the story has a moral, and how, uh, you know, it has, it has ideas that are general. Right hemisphere is more dominant for emotional processing. I'd like you to do this um, the homework for yourself. Look in the mirror and kind of smile slightly and then smile a big smile. Tell me along this line of symmetry, 
Do you see the left side of the face moving more, like smiling more than the than the right side, uh, or or, or the, the right side smiling more than the left side? So try to to see. And in most cases, if you really, really look closely, you will find that the right left side of the brain of the face is more emotionally expressive. Emotions show more on the left side of the face because that is controlled by the right side of the brain and it 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 it, it is more expressive emotionally. So um, also, the right side of the brain enables you to understand speakers' intentions and also the context. You know, as you process a sentence, you look for when it was said, how it was said, the tone of voice, is it a joke, is it intended to be, you know, literal, and so on. And theory of mind. Theory of mind, the right hemisphere is more dominant for it. But of course, the left hemisphere plays a role also. Inferences, uh, being able to um, look at the global aspects of discourse. Discourse is anything above the sentence level, whether that's a conversation or that's a story or a paragraph. So again, these are general functions. However, the right hemisphere cannot do its job without the left hemisphere the left hemisphere cannot do its job without the right hemisphere. They work together, and there is no right hemisphere person, no right, no left hemisphere person, as some still repeat. So, this concludes the section, and I thank you, and I hope that you find this helpful uh, as you study for the exam, and I wish you all the best. It has been a great pleasure to teach you this course, and I hope that you found it um, you found it rigorous enough, and that it challenges your thought, and that you have learned a lot from it. Anatomy is a very important um, an important course, and I, I hope that um, th that you really um, got the concepts, and you'll be ready to do anything if you if if you have the concepts. So thank you again, and best of luck uh, to you um, with the finals, all of them. Thanks. Bye.